Let's pray and we will get into our message this morning. Father God, thank you, Lord. God, thank you that this great privilege we have to open your written word together as a church family, Lord, that we can get into your word line by line, verse by verse, and hear from you. God, we pray that this moves us to be responded to your life through Jesus Christ, Lord, that you cause us to be out into the broken world, God, to reach the lost. God, not only do you edify our lives, but you've given us a purpose of being useful to you and your kingdom and reaching the lost. So we pray that that unfolds for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're in the book of Revelation, chapter 15. It's only eight verses. Um, I'm going to start with our story like we usually do. There's something called the incredible sound that toured the earth four times. It happened in August 27, 1883. The earth let out a noise louder than it's ever made since in recorded history. It was specifically 10.02 a.m. in 1883 when a sound emerged from the island of Krakatoa, which is in the Indonesia Islands. Uh, Krakatoa, this sound from Krakatoa was heard over 2,000 miles away in Australia, and even 3,000 miles away in the Rodriguez Islands. All in all, it was heard by 50 different geographical locations. I want you to think how crazy this loud sound would be. It's like being in Boston and clearly hearing a noise coming from Dublin, Ireland. Traveling at the speed of sound, it takes about four hours for that sound to cover that distance. This is the most distant sound that's ever been recorded in history that we have. So what caused this shattering sound, this loud bang? A volcano erupted on Krakatoa that, with a force, literally tore this island apart, shooting smoke smoke up into the air 17 miles high. This explosion was so deadly that it caused tsunami waves of over 100 100 feet and literally destroyed over 155 coastal villages uh, in all, it's estimated somewhere between 30 to 120,000 people literally lost their lives. One recorded history we have was from a British vessel that was 40 miles away from the island at the time of the explosion. The ship's captain wrote this in his log. He said, so violent are the explosions that the eardrums of over half my crew has been shattered. My thoughts are, are with my dear wife. I am convinced that the day of judgment has come. He perished in that. A barometer 100 miles away from Krakatoa registered the decibels at 172, the sound pressure. It was an unimaginable loud noise. Just to put that in context, a jackhammer, if you're by by it, emits about 100 decibels. While standing near a jet engine would be about 150 decibels, the human threshold for pain is 130 decibels, and Krakatoa was 172, recorded 100 miles away. Could you imagine what it would have been that close or that near to this? Five days after the explosion, weather stations around the globe observed an unprecedented spike in pressure reoccurring every 34 hours. 34 hours is about the time it takes for sound pressure waves to circle the globe, And it's estimated that it circled the globe three to four times. Just to put it in perspective, I'm sure that the entire globe during that time thought that this was the final destruction that came upon Earth. I I, I couldn't imagine the terror of what that feels like. Now, I know what it's like to be just standing here and hearing and feeling intense thunder and lightning. Does everybody know what that's like when you feel that crack? I don't know if anybody else, I'm like, man, God's coming soon. Like when those cracks and those thunders go, you know how small I feel? This big, insignificant. I know something else has complete control over everything. How horrifying this Krakatoa event might have been. And guess what? It was grand, but it was not and is not the grand finale. God's wrath is coming and there is a future for it. Now, this probably isn't the most exciting message to teach or to be part of on a Sunday morning, but we are teaching through the book of Revelation, verse by verse, line by line. Um, The book of Revelation in Greek is the Apocalypse. And in our modern dictionary, the Apocalypse is defined 
as the complete final destruction of the world. It, it, literally, the, the dictionary say, as in the biblical definition, uh, the biblical book of Revelation. Uh, it's defined as an event involving destruction or damage on an awesome or catastrophic scale. This book is a disclosure. <laughs> it's, it's the unveiling, the revealing of Jesus Christ uh, to humans, the exact nature of the events that's going to happen at the end times. He lays it out. We've been studying through these letters. We've gone through the seven churches. We've gone through um, the tribulation period. We've seen the past few weeks, we, we studied about this war that's being waged in heaven. Please reference our past messages. But today we're in chapter 15. The shortest chapter in the entire book of Revelation, when somebody's probably saying, great, I can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> Only eight verses, right? We're actually going to see this unfold over the next two weeks. Chapter 16 goes into detail about each one of these bowls of wrath that, that God places upon the earth. Let's look at verse 1 together. Chapter 15, verse 1. I love hearing those sounds of pages turning. It says this, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. Historically, we could put God's wrath into a few categories. Sowing and reaping. We're all familiar with this one, right? Logical consequences to sin. Those who plow iniquity and those who sow trouble harvest from it, right? Immediate reaction or some type of reaction to sin. We're all familiar with that. There's cataclysmic wrath which is massive destruction, judgment, like the great flood God placed upon the earth. There's abandonment wrath. In Romans 1, we see God give them over, which means God will remove restraint from sinners choosing to love evil and sin over a relationship with God. And here, today, we're talking about God's eternal wrath. This is what we're talking about today, the final result of God's eternal wrath being poured out on all sinners and the earth who is not repentant. Not that the earth needs to repent. But we have to understand from God's word that from the very beginning with Adam and Eve to this very chapter in Revelation 15, there's been this paradox that has existed. What's a paradox, you say? Thank God I'm here to answer your questions for you. <laughs> that, that, that was my joke for today. So. <laughs> Um, it's a definition of seem, a, seemingly, a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or true. That's the definition. Here's an example. Like the Dallas Cowboys are going to win the Super Bowl, right? That's a paradox, right? Here's another one. Wawa makes the best hoagies or the best steak sandwiches. Is that a paradox? In all seriousness... The paradox listed in here is at the same time of God's outpouring of wrath, from the beginning of time, we see God's outpouring of wrath mixed with God busy working to save sinners from eternal judgment from himself. It, I, I think it's one of the greatest paradoxes that ever existed. God's wrath and judgment is coming at the same time God is seeking sinners to turn from their sin to be saved unto himself. There's no, uh, we see this in the fullness of Jesus Christ. Last few weeks we talked through Revelation 14. God sends three angels out as a last witness unto the world. The first angel comes to proclaim the gospel. It's the last message of here's your time to be saved. Here's your time to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. To confess your sins unto the Lord. To be saved. The word says if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus was raised from the dead, I shall be saved. You shall be saved. And he sends this message out that don't take the number of the beast. Don't take, don't, don't, don't take the name of the beast. Don't take the markings after him. Believe in Jesus and be saved. These next two weeks, the final outpouring of God's wrath before the return of Christ. We'll talk about the details next week of the seven bowls that come out. First one, again, says, I saw another sign. Great and marvelous, seven angels hearing the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. John sees a sign. It's, it's something reoccurring, meaning there's another vision that he sees, and he's seen plenty of them by this point. 
This sign is great and marvelous. Why? Because John gets to see into heaven. He gets to see into the throne room where God is with himself. And he sees angels with seven plagues. And this is of great significance because it's the final outpouring of God's wrath. We've talked about God's wrath through the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, two-thirds of it, is fulfilling Old Testament prophecies. What God spoke in the beginning is coming true. And because the outpouring of God's wrath, he says that, that um, the seven angels having the seven last plagues. These are the last plagues. And a plague in Greek means a blow, a strike, a wound. It's the last ones coming. These plagues aren't like a minor disease or some pain. It means final, powerful, deadly blows like the grand finale. That would be the title of our message today. The grand finale, the end, the, the, the biggest spectacle you're going to see on humankind. It says, the wrath of God is complete. Now, complete in ancient Greek means to reach an end, to, to, or, or, or to reach an aim, remembering that Jesus cried out, it was finished. That sin was finally taken upon himself. It was finally completed. Here we see God's wrath will be completed upon those who have not believed in Jesus as Lord and Savior. In fact, God's hot wrath literally fulfills his eternal purpose. Meaning God's just not blowing off steam here. This is a final event of what he's been saying over and over again. It's been anticipated through the book of Revelation. Uh, Donnie talked about a few weeks ago about the trampling of grapes in the wine press. It's the final push. We see this word wrath. And it's interesting because me and Kevin went out. It was Kevin's birthday yesterday, by the way. Happy birthday, Kevin. So we, uh, we went out to lunch, and, and we went to a place that was owned by uh, a Greek woman. We actually had a chance to talk to her for a little bit. And we talked about this word thumos, which is the Greek word for wrath. It means passion, breathing hard, rage, outburst of anger, fierceness. Has anybody ever had, had that in your life? Oh, three people. Okay, sure. All right. Okay. Some of you need to get alone with God and pray. <laughs> Literally, this is, this is the final anger that's expressed against all unforgiveness. Sin must be judged. God is holy. Zephaniah 3.8 gives us a glimpse of this. It says, therefore, this is God speaking, therefore wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations, to assemble of the kingdoms, to pour out my indignation, my fierce anger, all over the earth shall be devoured with my fire of jealousy. Job says the wicked are reserved for the day of calamity, for they will be led forth in the day of fury. God's holy wrath is to come, but here and now for us, the paradox stands true. Second Peter says, the Lord is not slacking concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God so desires for everyone to get saved, yet at the same time, his wrath is holy and pleasing and worthy of praise. Chapter 15 unfolds. We're going to see three motives. We're going to work through this quick. We see God's vengeance. We see God's character. And we see God's plan. Verse 2 says, I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing in the sea of glass with harps of God. Now, John sees something like like a sea, like glass with fire. Now, it's not an actual ocean, but it's de- descripting, he's trying to describe something so beautiful and so majestic, he doesn't even have the words to do it. He sees this crystal-like platform before God's throne. It's like sitting at the beach on sunset, and you look out and you see the sparkling and the clearness coming off. What a beautiful sight. Moses had a similar vision of God's throne. He said in Exodus, he said, He saw the God of Israel, and under his feet appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as crystal as the sky itself. God's holy. And uh, the throne around him uh, we see revealed in his character. 
But this tranquil beauty of sea in here is mixed with fire of God's judgment because there's something about to happen unto the earth. Those who have clearly openly rejected God's grace and mercy face the expectant day of judgment with a fire that consumes all adversaries. John sees people gathered around God's throne in the midst of this final destruction, and he claims them as those who have been victorious over the beast. Now, our personal view, we kind of have to say it to back up this, we believe uh, after the, after the sef- seven churches that there's a rapture that happens and the born-again believers are taken out. And during the time of tribulation, there will be people that are saved that come to the earth. God leaves behind 144,000 that have a mark on him that can't be harmed. There are people that will be born again during this time. These people around the throne are those that were redeemed and born again through the most difficult time we're ever going to see in history during the tribulation. And it says they're victorious over the beast, not on their own might, not on their own power. It's the same way we're victorious over the beast because of the blood of the lamb and the power of our testimony and they love their lives not unto the end. They literally laid down their lives not willing to follow the beast but yet believing by faith in the Lord. Not only are these people victorious but they don't take the beast's image and they don't take his name. What we have to remember is during this time the Antichrist and the false prophet set up an image to the beast in Israel and orders everyone by the pain of death to receive the mark of the beast and to take his name and worship the image. Meaning, without the mark, you know what you face? Execution. Without the mark, you know what you face? No steak sandwiches. Difficult. Without the mark, no joking around, you can't buy, you can't sell. It's going to be incredibly difficult for people to survive during that time. Forget about concerning about yourself. What about your little kids and your family and the people that you know? People, because of pressure to feel good, are going to convert and follow the beast. They're going to face execution. But the tribulation believers, by God's power and eternal triumph over the false prophet, these people we see around the throne are martyred for God's namesake. The highest honor that anyone can receive is to be martyred for the gospel of Jesus Christ because these are the people that are dwelling under his throne and here we see them worshiping with God directly. We don't see them crying or complaining about the pain that they went through. One of the big ideas we're going to talk about, they learn how to praise and worship God in the midst of the worst difficult experience ever. You're going to kill me, I'm going to praise and worship God. Why? Because we're not made for this world. I want you to know that today. You're not made for this space. The challenges that we face, we go through incredible heartache and pain in this world. We, we all have our things, but it can't compare to what's coming next. The beauty, the majesty, the holiness, being in the presence of the Lord, being all consumed with him, not here where we're all consumed with us. In these texts, we see the saints holding a harp unto the Lord. They're praising and singing unto him. And we see they're rejoicing and they're singing praises unto the Lord, which should cause us, as born-again believers, to have a different pursuit of the loss. Because, yeah, there is a group of people that will be singing and praising unto the Lord. But those that don't believe, there's going to be an internal place for where they go too. It's literally called hell, where there's pain and suffering. Paul writes in Romans 12, he says, Never take your own vengeance, beloved, But leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Uh, About a few years ago, about about a few years ago, a few years ago, a group of people donated us a house in Upland that we use as our discipleship house. When we took it over, we didn't know, but somebody went back to the city, and I got a letter in the mail on the call saying, I'm operating an illegal house, and there's all these things going wrong, and they're going to, execute judgment against us and all these weird things we didn't go over there and yell and cry and complain we know how we fight our battles it starts on our knees before the lord and then we went over (laughs) and had a deep discussion of how did you know how did you know we're doing something wrong you've never been at our house you've never talked to us you've never seen inside that but we've learned to understand that attacks 
accusations always come from Satan himself. Accusations don't come from God. And then there's the process of what happens in this, causing us to be refined and to be dependent upon him, to be willing to stand upon righteousness of God's righteousness and to do the right thing behind it. There's a process that gets worked out. Believers in this verse undergo a deep terror, suffer the pain of a violent, violent death. And in spite of all that violent persecution, they receive faith, with his, which is a gift from God and endureth forever. Ultimately, they stand triumphantly before the throne of God, and they get to watch as God takes vengeance, vengeance on those that persecuted them. This is more proof of the character of God, which causes them to sing. Does anybody in here sing? Does anybody in here sing in private? Can anybody in here sing really well? Great, you're on, the wor- you're on the worship team, you're on the worship team. That was a trick question, you're busted. Finally got you. Um, this is more proof, look at the songs that they sing. Verse 3, 3 and 4. They sing the songs of Moses. This is the redeemed. They break out in song and praise. Movement of the Holy Spirit. The servant, it says the song of Moses, the servant of the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works. God, your works are so great and marvelous. Lord Almighty, just and true are your ways. That's who he is. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's present everywhere. O King of the saints, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? Who cannot fear God and not glorify his name? Everybody, every knee will confess. You alone are holy, Lord. All nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. My first year uh, going through the discipleship program, our discipleship pastor is a guy named Pastor John Swenson. The Rev, they called him. John was one of the guys that was just moved by the Holy Spirit. You knew when he was around. And in our discipleship class, these are a bunch of people like me out of, out of, out of prison, um, you know, off the streets, and day one, you're in there, you're helping people, and then you get in this class, you're like, you know what we're doing today? We're going to sing songs about the Lord. Now, I never sung a song about the Lord before, and I didn't know what to expect, but what he taught us was to memorize the scriptures and to give it back in songs. Here's one. You ready for it? Um, and, and, and I sing it periodically. Usually I do it when I'm holding Ava or Max. Um, we would sing one, and there, it, he, he would say, it's bubbling, it's bubbling, it's bubbling in my soul. We sing it, we shout it. Jesus made us whole. Some people might under, not understand it, but this one thing I know, it's a bub, 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 bubbling. It's bubbling in my soul. I remember these songs 17 years ago. There's, they're on and on and on. I know three or four of them. A part of it is singing songs of saying, remember not the sins of my youth out of Psalms. To remember these things. And whatever situation I'm in, if I'm in a hard, difficult times, it doesn't matter what it is. When I sing praises about the Lord, it changes my heart and my mind about the current situations. We leave church sometimes and I hear my kids or people singing these songs that we sung later on. The opposite of this is true. If I'm watching horror gangster movies or or remembering all the gangster rap I used to sing back in the day, those things can pop up in your head just like that. What we take in is what we give out. The reason why I'm saying this is because everything these saints are bringing in, they're giving out. They're in the midst of God himself giving praise and worship unto him. We must train our minds and our heart and our flesh to worship and serve God in all circumstances. It's one of the duties that we have here. Moses um, gave glorification to God through the hard, difficult times. Israel sung. They sung songs on the other side of, of the sea when it was split. They, they, they sung songs in the midst of the desert. It's a way to remember. It's a way to train our heart and our mind. Um, the song here is, is for victory and deliverance for God's righteousness. At the same time, they're praising him for his judgment of wrath on God's enemies. It's a praise unto him. The saints before the throne will also sing songs of the Lamb, Jesus. It's a song unto God and to the Lamb, the eternal Redeemer. 
And once this song of worship is complete, look at verses 5 through 8. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened, the innermost part. And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four, four creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Here's something important. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Each of these angels have an unfolding wrath or drama that will unfold that will fulfill and assign duty according to God's plan. God put a plan in motion a long time ago, and here we see it coming to completion. It says completed again for the second time in this, in this passage. It's always been God's purpose to judge sinners and to destroy sin. And I think it's obvious, I don't know about you, but I still question it, even though we see it written in the scriptures over and over again, how long, God, will you allow the wicked to prosper? How long will you allow those that cheat and operate in sin to get away with the things they do? How long, Lord? How long? Until this time. Until this time, God's chosen time that it comes out. It's always been his purpose to destroy and to judge sinners. In Matthew, Jesus says, he says, The eternal fire has been prepared for the devil and his angels and awaits those who whom God will one day sentence to an eternal punishment. God's holy angels at this time have been waiting. These angels, their specific role has been waiting for this for all of eternity to do their part. And we know this vision, John uses this phrase, after, we, we know it's a new vision because John says, after this time we looked. And John sees the tabernacle. The tabernacle of testimony of heaven has been opened. And it's referring to the Holy of Holies. See, there was an earthly tabernacle that was made by Israel through God's direction here on earth when they traveled and then finally uh, when they set up in Israel and Solomon built the first temple. The tabernacle, the way the temple was designed, is a mirror image of what's in heaven. And we see that because we have had a chance to go through the book of Revelation before and see references from Ezekiel and... um, Exodus and Daniel and some of these other things, we see that the inner tabernacle. And in the center of the center is the Holy of Holies. Where when even in Moses' time, when that smoke filled, nobody could enter that place. I mean, God's presence was there. God's presence can't, can't be in the presence of sin. He's so holy. He's so perfect. Anything in there is instantly destroyed. And what refers to the tabernacle of testimony is because the most important piece that Israel carried around in the Ark of the Covenant um, is the testimony of the two stone tablets. It's the testimony from God unto men, saying these are the commandments that you're called to live and abide by. And John sees these angels having these seven plagues coming out of the temple. They're holy, they're clean, They're pure white with gold bands wrapped around them. But don't be confused because God is sending them out to execute judgment. They may look majestic and and pure and angelic, and they are, but they're being used for God's purpose. It says one of the cherubim, the living creature, we can't go into it now if you want to talk more about it after. Um, He gives to them an individual bowl full of God's wrath each. And it's like this bowl is this saucer filled with something that will actually be, we'll see it next week, the actual thing that's thrown down on the earth one by one till all seven are complete. Those who refuse to drink the cup of salvation are literally about to be judged, poured out with the bowls of wrath because God, who's holy, lives forever and ever And he's looking and he's putting an end to sin and it can't exist in God's presence. The temple was filled with smoke because of God's glory. It's filled with smoke from the glory of God. Why? Because of his power and his holiness. 
No one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues and angels were completed. This declares how God's judgment is irreversible, that no longer can it be hindered or restrained in any possible way, because access to his temple in heaven would not long be denied. After this, we'll see what's going to happen uh, with God being able to be in worship and fellowship with people for all of eternity. What a beautiful sight it is. A few weeks ago, me and Emily went down to vacation. We always usually travel with Emily's sister, and she has two kids, a boy and a girl, that are uh, maybe you know three or so years older than our kids on either side. Um, so Max and Ava, my, my two kids, love spending time with their cousins. They love being with them in worship, and they love playing with them all day long. Like All they want to do is go with Max and Ava. I'm going to let you know how much my kids love uh, my sister and brother-in-law. When Ava cries, she's like, I want Anna. And you're like, well, what about mom and dad? Like, we're right here too, right? Yeah. But there's something special about this closeness that we have. So we would go to the beach every day, and our kids just love playing at the beach and playing with sand and building stuff and castles. And every day, I'd watch the cousins get together, and right on the edge of the beach, they'd try to build this castle and dig like a moat around there because the hope was the water would come up and would go in the moat, and their castle would stand tall. And they would try to do this every day, and every day I'd watch the same thing, that the waves would come up and erase their work over and over. But hours, for hours, endlessly, it was great to watch because I just got a chance to sit in a chair and take a nap, but like for hours they're trying to dig in this area that would come back with waves and get washed away over and over again. Sometimes for two, three hours they would play, and everything was wiped away. And I noticed something. About 15, 10 or 15 minutes after they were done, as the, as the um, waves were coming in and high tide was coming back, that the sand wiped away all evidence of anything they worked on as if no one ever played there, as if it never even happened. No existence, just like that. The hours of toil and energy they put in to trying to build something that would be in their minds magnificent, complete, awesome gets wiped away in just a matter of minutes. You know what I noticed? My kids were still with me. I had my kids. The work that they tried to do was gone. It's all wiped away. God is destroying sin. He's going to wipe it away. There will be no evidence of it. The effects of sin, of his holy wrath, and through him placing his wrath upon Jesus Christ, through who we believe we have eternal security to be with the Lamb and the Father and the Holy Spirit forever and ever and ever. No matter how hard my kids tried, their work was completely wiped away as if sin's going to be wiped away and judged and taken away. The grand finale of God's wrath is coming upon the earth. And when it does, it's holy and pleasing and righteousness and, 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 and holy unto him. It's going to happen in front of us. God's tribulation, his plan invokes judgment for sin. And we have to understand that it is holy and pleasing. But no matter what we face here and now, no matter how much heartache, pain, death and destruction we have, whatever loss we accrue, God has a plan in place. God has a plan in place. And we get to be with him for yet forever, singing and praising songs. For as many humans are going to lose their lives and, 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 and receive eternal, and eternal judgment in hell, we should cause us to have an impact on those around us that we know that are perishing. It's a real thing. God's holy and pleasing, yet his wrath is coming. God, use us in this process. We praise him for what's coming. Here and now, we have the opportunity to share with those that are perishing. It's the goodness of what we get to do. And in our joy, we know that it will be finished. It will be complete. Just like it was completed where Jesus took God's penalty upon him. The day of wrath for the rest of the world will be completed as well. And we praise God 
in that process. I don't know where you are today. I know mostly everybody here in some way, but I don't know where your faith is in the Lord. I met a guy a few weeks ago that I've known for, I I met with a guy a few weeks ago that I've known for about 15 years. And he said, John, I sat in pews for about 12 years thinking I was a born-again believer, but I never actually gave my life to Jesus Christ. This is why it's important in every message to put it out there. Do you believe Jesus is God? Do you believe Jesus took your penalty of sin upon him? Do you believe in your heart? Have you confessed in your mouth that you believe Jesus was raised from the dead? The word of God says, you shall be saved. And the salvation is the beginning of our process of walking with God. It's not the end. The end is fulfilled in heaven when we're with him. The beginning starts the process of building a relationship with him and using our lives for other people. It's always the big L. It's always the big L. The love that happens between us and the Father through the Son causes us to reach out to a broken world. We get to do that today. There is a grand finale, more grand than any fireworks you're going to see, than volcanoes explode, more grand than, 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 than trying to build something in the ocean. God's wrath is coming, but his salvation is here and now, and, and it's able for us to share with people. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, God, thank you, Lord. God, over the next two weeks, we're going to talk about the final bold judgments coming upon the earth. Thank you, Lord God, that you've given us an opportunity to be redeemed and to be saved. But more than that, God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to be here where we're at in Chester, Lord, to be able to reach our neighbors with this message, God, that we, as the body of Christ, wherever we go and work and travel through school, that we can take this message everywhere we go. Please use it for your kingdom forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Guys, let's stand. We're going to sing a final.